Um, just want to give a little bit of a background, a little outline for what I'm going to cover today. Uh, first off, I'm going to touch on a review of background information on pediatric obesity, describe lifestyle and behavioral interventions for pediatric obesity. I'm going to touch on the evidence base for these interventions, and then get into future directions for intervention research. First, the bad news. I think most people are well aware that from roughly 1970 to the year 2000, we've seen a, almost a 400% increase in the prevalence of pediatric obesity in the United States. And we see here numbers in 2007, the rates of obesity across the U.S. ranging from a high of almost 22% in Mississippi to about 10% in the state of Oregon. Um, the current most recent data from the CDC and Ogden's group show that 16.7% of children two to nine years of age are obese, and 31.8% of children are overweight or obese. Now the good news, if you can say that, is that there's been no statistically significant upward trend in the rate of obesity from 2000 to 2010. When you break this down by gender, we do actually see a slight uptick and increase for males. We've seen a pretty significant uptake in the rates of obesity for African American males so now that those rates are they're rate roughly commensurate with their female counterparts. I think it's important to step back just to give a definition here. I don't want to assume anything. Um, BMI is, I'm sure people know, body mass index, which is weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. And BMI, is, it's just an estimate of body fat or adiposity. Now, arguably, it's probably the best compromise between reliability and accuracy of measurement and the ease of administration and obtaining this measure. Um, there are other measures that are probably better if you want to use DEX machine, BOD pods, even electrical impedance can get better direct measures of body fat. Um, in adults, uh, we use strict cutoffs, uh, BMI cutoffs, to define overweight and obesity. Obese is defined at a BMI of 30 or above and overweight is 25 to 30. In children, we can't use BMI cutoffs because the mean BMI for kids varies as a function of age and gender. Um, thus, we use BMI percentiles, which allows us to compare a child's BMI relative to their age, to age and gender norms. So obese, uh, criteria for obesity is at the, uh, a BMI at the 95th percentile or above, and overweight is at the 85th to 95th percentile. I'm not going to go into great details here because I really want to focus on the intervention components of, of addressing this epidemic, um, but the health impacts of obesity are profound and that is definitely the case in kids. We see that childhood and adolescent obesity, especially in adolescents, we see that it tracks into adulthood. And we know that there are a number of significant negative health impacts associated with obesity in kids. Greater rates of type 2 diabetes, sleep apnea, non-fatty liver disease, orthopedic problems like Blount's disease, or just slower recovery to injuries, uh, and hypertension, dyslipidemia, and abnormalities in coronary arteries. You know, for example, um, obese adolescents are 10 times more likely than their non-obese peers to experience at least two cardiovascular risk factors. You know, we also hear a lot about the psychosocial impacts of obesity. And Data is a little bit mixed, and there's certainly some de debate, but I think a number of researchers and even the Institute of Medicine in, 19, in, 19, in 2005, you know, in looking at the wealth of data, came to the conclusion that children that are obese are at greater risk for having psychosocial difficulties. And oftentimes the literature points to poor body image or lower self-esteem, uh, increased exposure to peer victimization, maybe higher depressive symptoms. And oftentimes this is linked to stigmatization. And a number of studies over the years have shown that obese youth are looked upon much less favorably, unfortunately, than their non-obese peers. And that phenomenon is seen oftentimes as young as kids in the preschool age. Okay? And I even, even noted here, you know, economic impacts, uh, healthcare expenditures, um, and quality of life. You know, a paper by Schwimmer uh, like 10 years ago and then building forward has shown that overweight or obese kids especially are have lower quality of life than their non-obese peers and oftentimes commensurate with kids with cancer and other chronic health conditions. 
So why the dramatic impact or the dramatic increase? I don't put this picture up here to make light of the situation, but you know, oftentimes you hear a picture is worth a thousand words, and this points out a number of the different things. And you know, we could spend a day, two days a week talking about all the different factors that, you know, some more obvious and some, I think I was talking with Josh right up here, that are maybe more theoretical about what is contributing to this fat and what things in the environment have changed over the last 30 years that might be contributing to obesity. It's a lot of important research. But, you know, at its most fundamental level, I think we want to look at, you know, for, at the individual, calories in versus calories out or energy expenditure. Certainly genes play a role in the individual ranges and some other significant conditions that are related to obesity, but I think most people agree that it's not because of genes that we've seen this dramatic increase in the last 30 years. So, you know, some of the things in the literature that, is, that are pointed to as far as dietary intake, the increased consumption of and greater access to pre-packaged, pre-processed, calorie-dense foods anytime, anywhere, greater amount of meals consumed away from home, um, at fast food restaurants or regular sit down restaurants. Increase in portion size, both you know, in what is served and what is sold and ultimately what kids eat and what is a typical portion size that people take in. And another one is increased in sweetened beverage intake. And you can see the portion size of sweetened beverages. That's actually pretty typical from, you know, so everything's, everything's what, biggie sized or super sized in this day and age. Um, Certainly, you know, everyone's heard of the a toxic or the obesogenic environment, uh, the family environment, marketing, public policies, many more things that are encouraging overeating and inactivity. I mean, a couple of the things are, you know, proliferation of opportunities for sedentary activity, whether that's video games, okay, whether that is 300 different cable and direct TV channels, probably a lot more than that, um, the internet. You know, obviously, there are good components of the internet, but you know, lots of opportunities for physical activity. The built environment that you know, is much less conducive to physical activity. Less time dedicated to gym and other physical activities in the school environment. Marketing that targets kids for less than optimal health food choices and eating. Um, and changes in family lifestyle and family structures. You know, we see many more families where we have both parents working or single single parent families and when those with those types of requirements on parents they make it more difficult to monitor kids or provide healthy options both food and physical activity and there's a lot more um, you know my favorite there just an example you know the Mickey Mouse plate with a bunch of food you know pairing those fun things with less than optimal food choices um, you know, with this environment sometimes it seems like you know when we take a step forward oftentimes we're two steps back um, and it's awfully challenging to make a dent in this um, there is good news, certainly. The issue of obesity and how we can try to address this public health epidemic, if we say epidemic, is, is a lot more attention on that uh, right now, both in that, that it's a concern and what we can try to do, both at individual, community, public, you know, at higher levels of the ecological model. I'll talk about that in a second. Certainly, also a good piece of news is that improvements in diet and, and exercise can be effective in reducing some of these health problems. Reductions in weight status, oftentimes through physical activity and exercise, have been associated with improvements in insulin, fasting glucose, lipid levels, triglycerides, blood pressure. Some research was studied by Kirk and colleagues at Cincinnati. In one of their studies, they found that a decrease of about 0.15 units in BMIZ score, and I'll talk about that in a second, has been associated with one impro significant improvements in one component of metabolic syndrome. Well, uh, sometimes increases of almost 0.5 BMIZ score units have been associated with across the board improvements in met metabolic syndrome. So you see that you know, if we can get some changes in, health, in physical activity and weight, we can see some improvements in these health status markers. Um, I think many people have heard of the ecological model and what, you know, the focus of the ecological model talks about you know, the interwoven relationships uh, between the individual behavior and individual's behavior, in this context, individual's health behavior and the environment and that the environment, both local, community, friends, family, uh, you know, I said schools, churches, all the way on up to public policy, national, state laws, all those environmental factors impact individual behavior and certainly impact health behaviors. And then the flip side of that, if we are going to try to make a dent in healthy lifestyles, in obesity for kids and adults, 
it's going to take efforts and interventions and, and changes at all levels of the ecological model. Um, and we are seeing efforts at each of these different, and there's a lot of research in different areas and some good work. Um, today, I'm going to be focusing more on lifestyle interventions that really focus and work on, you know, focus at the individual and the family level. So I think it's important to provide context for that, um, but while acknowledging a lot of important research and important efforts at higher levels of the ecological model. Um, and the focus really of the talk today is on the evidence base and describing comprehensive lifestyle or behavior family lifestyle interventions to address pediatric obesity. Um, it's probably the, the most ubiquitous and probably the, the most studied intervention addressing, you know, psychosocial intervention, non-medication interventions to address childhood obesity. And in general, and I'll get into each of these components a little bit more, um, these are multi-component programs that focus on improving healthy lifestyle behaviors, improving healthy eating habits, and increasing physical activity in children. Um, usually involve education and counseling that have primarily three components, if you will. You can break it down in lots of different ways. You know, focusing on nutrition or dietary intake, increasing physical activity, and then utilizing behavioral strategies, behavioral change strategies to help facilitate adoption of healthier eating habits and physical activities for kids and families. Um, the interventions can be or are often delivered in either a group or one-to-one -one individual contacts. Oftentimes it's a combination of both. You may have groups that are supplemented by some individual times with a therapist or a counselor. Um, they usually involve children and parents in treatment. You know, behavioral family interventions, you know, by the, the name there, we're focusing on kids and parents together. And I think most people agree to make changes and help kids make changes. You have to work with the family and work with the parents, especially with younger kids. But even adolescents, I would say, you know, to different degrees, that's pretty important. Parents have a great amount of control, obviously, over the kids' environment, what's available in the home, and what kids do. So you work together with both the kids and the parents. Though there is different research, and I've done part of that, where we might look at just working with the parents individually in treatment, and then, then, then through the parents, you're having contact with the kids. Um, these interventions often involve some type of in-session physical activity component either to make it fun with the kids or sometimes it's much more structured and there might be physical activity, aerobic exercise, dance components in the intervention itself that tries to burn calories on a regular basis for kids. Um, and these interventions oftentimes vary in duration and intensity. And that's another important point that we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, it's an important point, you know, when you're looking at the literature, sometimes you're comparing apples and oranges in some ways because of the duration and, and other aspects of things. Um, I want to talk about, uh, just looking at my time here, okay, um, dietary change, um, that aspect of things. Oftentimes, obviously, there's a great, great effort in these interventions and in focusing on helping kids adopt healthier dietary habits. And that will involve education, um, well-balanced diets, healthy food preparation, helping, making, helping kids make healthy choices. That may involve exposure and education on the USDA's My Plate Guidelines, used to be My Pyramid Guidelines, that's recently changed. Um, helping kids and parents learn about uh, adequate portion sizes of different foods and how you can measure portion sizes, um, quick and simply. Uh, reading nutrition labels, eating breakfast and not skipping breakfast to get off to a good start. Eating family meals, so having the family together more often during the week and limiting meals away from home. Um, sometimes that wealth of information can be a little bit overwhelming for kids, uh, so a lot of programs can, will use some type of maybe classification system to make it a little bit easier. One that's commonly been used, and you may have heard, probably heard about, is the stoplight or traffic light system that was popularized by Len Epstein um, over the years. And in this system, you know, we categorize foods into three categories, green, yellow, and red. And there are similar systems that might do things a little bit differently. Green food, usually based on nutrient content, uh, maybe fat grams. And green foods are your go foods. So we're talking about foods that are high in nutrition, but low in calories or fat. A lot of the fruits and vegetables, and you can vary in how you might categorize that. But kids are encouraged to eat more, and sometimes as many green foods as they want, within reason, obviously. Um, yellow foods are oftentimes where you get, kids get most of their nutrients, but 
they can be also a little bit high in calories, so you just have to watch portion sizes and how much you might want to eat of yellow foods. And red foods are your low nutrient, high fat, high sugar foods. Um, and kids are encouraged to limit. I would never say, uh, you know, cut it all together, but limit how many red foods they may take. Um, programs vary in how they try to address caloric intake and reducing caloric intake. You know, part of the, the idea of trying to balance the energy, you know, equation in, in a child is, you know, looking at how we can reduce calories, increase physical activity. And some programs will take a real focus on actually targeting decreases in caloric activities. For example, influencing a balanced deficit diet where they may have kids target a calorie intake of 12 to 1500 calories per week. And they'll balance that and that can be moved up basic, based on you know, uh, baseline dietary intake. And they, you know, there will be an actual gradual shaping down in time to try to reach that goal. Other programs will focus more on, you know, not real strict focus on counting calories, but making substitutions, trying to eat more green and yellow foods instead of red foods. And hopefully by encouraging healthy choices and maybe having specific plans for that, we'll see a healthier balance and a gradual reduction, but there's not a, as much of a strict emphasis on calories. And there's a debate oftentimes about what is the best way to do that. Um, in our programs, we work in community settings real world community settings, it's, you know, you get a much greater variety in families with a lot of barriers. It's difficult to do the things you need to, to target and keep track of calories. I think that's pretty challenging. So um, that's what we do in our programs. Um, and obviously some of the programs, you get a much more streamlined focus on specific food groups, fiber, fruit and vegetables, or cutting back on sweetened uh, beverages. Physical activity is obviously an important point. Trying to increase how much physical activity kids participate in. The American Academy of Pediatrics and other organizations you know, recommend that kids get roughly 60 minutes of moderate physical activity per day. Um, we know most kids don't get that and overweight and obese kids you know, are at even greater risk for getting much lower than that. Not all kids. Um, I knew at some point I would knock something over. It's a tradition. Luckily there's not a phone I'm going to knock over. So. Um, and it, it, these programs will vary in type in the sense that some programs there is a physical activity component, and it might be a structured program where they're doing aerobic exercise. Um, the idea of trying to, be, to expose kids to different types of physical activities, fun physical activities. Um, other type programs, you know, there might just be a way to keep kids, it, it's fun and active, it's not as structured, um, but they're still trying to expose kids to new uh, act activities. You know, in our programs, we, when we're meeting with kids, we combine you know, education with movement and activity. So we may have the stoplight game where kids will be walking around. When it's a green food, they walk, run. When it's a yellow food, they walk. And when it's a red food, we'll call out a food, they'll have to stop. Or we'll have a relay. And they walk down and they pick up a food and they have to come back. And then they put it either on the red tag board, the yellow tag board, the green tag. You can think of a whole bunch of activities. And a lot of people use fun things to make it active, but fun. Um, so the idea is, you know, both what happens in session, but then obviously, how can we get kids to be more active outside a session? And that can be structured sports, structured aerobic activities, fun activities like dancing or interactive video games, and then family activities, more time with mom and dad, bike riding, going out for a walk after dinner, or just those lifestyle activities, you know, trying to walk, parking in the, you know, the example of parking uh, further back at the grocery store and walking in instead of parking up close to the grocery store. Emphasizing a variety of different types of activity and, and making those goals to do that. And certainly an important part is also a focus on trying to decrease sedentary activity. Okay? Um, and oftentimes you know, focusing mostly on TV, but there can be other forms of activity, certainly. Um, and the, the thought being that hopefully if we're cutting back on sedentary time, kids may be a little bit more active. Obviously there's not a one-to-one -one relationship with that. But also an important point is if we're not watching TV as much, there's less exposure to marketing that targets kids for unhealthy foods. And when we eat, what do we do oftentimes? We eat more. So cutting back on that hopefully will reduce caloric intake. And I think research has borne out that in some cases. Last but not least, behavior change strategies, which you know, I think are an essential and very important component uh, of this. Reminds me of my girls when I do yoga, all of a sudden they'll walk up and start doing funny little things. Um, I never look that good, so <laughs> they don't. Um, one aspect, obviously, that you'll hear a lot about is self-monitoring. And you know, research has shown that 
engagement in self-monitoring is oftentimes associated with improvements in health behavior change in general and a wide different types of health behavior. And we see that with outcomes in pediatric obesity interventions too. And that can vary from some programs monitoring and writing down everything a child eats and drinks and how it's prepared and what grease you use and what are the condiments and then weighing portion sizes and then calculating calorie content all the way down to just document and maybe keeping track of uh, fruits and vegetables or beverages consumed. Um, and I think it's certainly an important point to make that the more self-monitoring, the more it can help families because through self-monitoring increases awareness of eating patterns and, and the amount that one's eating. Also, it gives the interventionists more information on helping families make recommendations. But on the other hand, self-monitoring takes a lot of work and can be challenging. And you see it as a fundamental component in adult interventions, but when you're talking about kids and families, you've got parents with multiple kids who've got work, who've got different things going on, and it can be challenging um, and can be a barrier in my, in my experience if it's pushed on families too much. So we really try to work with families to find a way to monitor something, but without pushing them away. But it, it's a really important point if you can get people to do something like that. Um, defining target behaviors and setting goals, okay? You know, behavior change strategies, critical to target specific behaviors. You can't, it's not good enough. Okay, you need to try to eat healthier. Let's try to get some fruits and vegetables and, and do a better job at eating balanced. And then make sure you guys are getting up and active each day. You know, we need specific targeted behaviors. You're going to focus on cutting back on, uh, on soda. Okay? You're gonna, we're going to focus on increasing fruits and vegetables. We're going to focus on cutting back our red foods to maybe an average of 10 per day to 8 per day and then gradually down a little bit. Setting specific goals and then um, hopefully reinforcing or rewarding goal achievement. And I'm not talking about necessarily you know, money and, and more preferred foods. I'm talking about things like with positive time with parents, praise, extra special time for different things like that. Um, positive parenting, you know, using contingencies, helping parents learn how to set goals, set rewards, how to set limits with kids and then enforce those limits but do it in a supportive manner by giving kids choices. Helping parents communicate in a supportive manner but not picking food battles. I have a good example of one of our first groups we did, you know, with families making wonderful changes. The boy was doing a great job. Mom was proud. He was proud of himself. They're going out to a restaurant with their friends and family, um, some of the kids, and he's like, they sit down and, I'm going to have a hamburger and fries. No, you know, come on, Tom, we don't do that. We eat, you eat salad now. He's looking at his friends in their order. No, no, I'm having a hamburger and fry. No, you're not. We have salad now. The next level, crying, tears, fighting. And obviously, that's not something we want. We want parents and kids to do things like make plans ahead of time. And if a child really wants to do it, and something, back off. Pick your battles. Set plans later on. Kids are going to make those choices at times. So how can you have families keep it positive and work together to make fun choices, okay? And we have to focus on gradual changes. Stimulus control. How can we set up the environment so that it's more conducive to making healthy changes? Sometimes you could, people will call it sneaky changes. Um, you know, making sure that the high, highly desirable foods, optimal foods like fruits and vegetables are out on the counter in places that are seen, that are easier to access less than optimal red foods or others are in the back of the refrigerator, the back of the cupboard. So they're not, the cookies aren't right on the counter. So when the kid walks by, ah, I grab it. Or daddy walks by and grabs it. Um, you know, opportunities for physical activity are in plain sight that they prompt kids. And this can even be taken to the next level. You know, helping parents see how stimulus control works so that when they're driving home from work with their kids or if they pick the kids up at school, instead of driving by the main drag that has McDonald's and Burger King and the or Dairy Queen and the kids, can we stop? Can we stop? You know, learning where to drive and take a different route home. So those cues are not right in front of them to encourage and, and, and prompt those types of interactions. And certainly parental modeling. The whole idea of do what I say but not what I do doesn't work too well, okay? How can we get parents to work together to model effective behavior change for their kids? Sometimes these programs will actually target parents for weight change. You know, we, in our programs, we don't, you know, it's not a qualification that parents have to be overweight too, though we see with the current rates in the U.S., a lot of parents are. 
But I think all parents, all individuals can benefit from healthy lifestyle. So we work with kids and parents to make changes together. Um, other critical, I think, features of this, assessing goal achievement each week and barriers to change. So it's not just enough to do some education, set a goal, and then go to the next week and set a new goal. You know, when you work with families on a consistent basis, how did it go? What worked well? What didn't work well? And then trying to change and revise those plans and work with them. You know, we often we use a group environment setting, so we're getting feedback from other parents you know, about what are ideas that they can use to help each other. It's always better if you're in a group setting, if a recommendation comes from another parent as opposed to Dr. Janicki or somebody else in the room. Um, it carries a little more credence sometimes, if you will. So there's a combination of that. You know, in integrating various behavior components throughout the intervention. It's not just, okay, today we're talking about contracts and then we're gonna talk about praise this week. You do, but then you bring it in in each session to help families make change and use the examples that they bring up and then apply those behavior strategies with them. Um, support from interventionists and if it's in a group setting, other participants is really important. Making lifestyle changes and sustaining it over time is tough, right? Um, and you hear lots of stories about less than optimal interactions that people may have with family members, friends, or some healthcare professionals. So providing support, support for these changes, and I'm skipping down here, and making it positive and fun. It sounds obvious, but it's an important point of things, I think, for me. And even if a family doesn't make the, the, all the changes you want, if they have a good time, maybe they're associated with, wow, if I'm working with people on this, it can be a good thing to talk about. It's a fun time, so they're more open to it as they go into the future. And certainly in a lot of programs, we'll take time to address a, emotional and social issues. We'll talk about low self-esteem and body image and how to build self-esteem, about coping skills for dealing with peer victimization and a variety of different other things, coping with stressful interactions. Um, I do want to hit on this real quickly. I know when you get going here, I start talking more than I anticipated. Um, uh, I think people are aware of this, but as we talk about the research, you know, common methods where we report weight status and weight status change. We know about weight, BMI, Another one that we'll read about and hear about is BMI Z-score, which is usually a standard deviation score. It helps facilitate comparison across age and gender for kids. Um, and this example is a BMI Z-score of zero is at the 50th percentile. Roughly a BMI Z-score of 1.0 is roughly the 85th percentile, and 2.0 is roughly the 95th percentile. And another one you'll hear me refer to is percent overweight, which is really a comparison of you know, where the child is for their BMI percentile relative to the mean for that age, right? So if the mean is 15 and a child's BMI is 20, they're 33% overweight. If it's their BMI is 30 and the mean is 15, that's 100% overweight. So just give a touch background there. And certainly the issue of weight maintenance versus weight loss, I think we have to briefly touch on this. You know, I think we know it's as children go, maintenance of weight um, and if you maintain weight while a child grows in height, you're going to see decreases in BMI because of that formula. And for many kids, you know, weight maintenance is the goal. And that if you see kids maintain weight and kind of grow in height, that's going to be good enough. But others sometimes that are much more heavier or more morbidly obese, um, or if we look at programs and you see kids trying to engage in treatment and they don't see success, then there might be a little bit more of an emphasis on weight loss. And when weight loss is encouraged, if you look at the expert committee uh, on obesity, I think it's from the American Medical Association and others, you know, they recommend that you know, a maximum of a one pound decrease per month for kids two to five years of age and up to two pounds per week for obese children and adolescents. Obviously, every kid's different and you have to, you know, focus on working with a medical provider when you're looking at uh, weight loss that might be more than that. So I want to go over some individual studies here and I got to acknowledge there's so many studies out there and so many made analysis. I've just tried to pick some that I think are good examples. Sometimes there are people I know, others I don't, but I, I'm just going to cover it. So no offense to anybody out there because uh, a lot of great research. Um, I think it would, I have to emphasize and talk a little bit about Len Epstein's work because, you know, Len Epstein and his group have published a, a, a number of studies over the years uh, in the 80s and 90s and then follow-ups on long-term outcomes you know in the last 10-15 years and I think he does a lot of research now on behavioral economics and a lot of other issues certainly. Um, you know the series of papers that he uh, published uh, focused mostly his program was a six-month 
comprehensive behavioral intervention program uh, involves simultaneous groups for kids and parents. Interventions usually range in about weekly sessions for eight to 12 weeks and then kind of fading contact until you got like once per month over the last two months. So it was like a six months in total. Um, interventions delivered oftentimes by dietitians or PhD level psychologists. Um, and the, the focus on most of his research is with kids, eight to 12 years of age. I mean, he used a stoplight program, which I'm not gonna go into again, because I discussed that, but definitely used a, a caloric target of 1,200 to 1,500 calories, gradually fading to that level. Um, that was a core element of all his research. Most of it, I should say, that dietary stoplight program. But then he would vary, they varied in, in looking at different types of physical activity programs, uh, maybe comparing sedentary activity focus to physical activity focus. Um, and parents were almost always targeted for change in the, these types of programs. And you know, the results, in a, in been looking at the data together, um, and published in his most recent 2007 article looking at 25 years back on things. Um, you see the effect sizes for the most part are, are moderate to large, pretty good effect sizes. Um, and if you look at 10 year follow up, you know, the, the, and there they report that 34% of participants decrease their percent overweight by 20% and roughly 30% of the kids were no longer obese. Um, now, we're not controlling, that's just the kids that participated in the program and one would certainly ask, well, how many kids aren't obese without an intervention at that point? Good question, but certainly some positive effect sizes. You know, a couple things, certainly, they, they also found that younger children seem to do better at 24 month follow-up. Girls seem to benefit a little bit more. Um, one of the limitations I think people commonly point to is that you know, in these studies, a lot of the samples uh, we're mostly Caucasian to middle upper class families, but to be fair, that's a criticism of a lot of the literature in general. And you know, most of Epstein's work, you know, I wouldn't say it's the highest effect sizes in, of all the research, but for the most part, you know, most folks haven't been able to get this level of change. There are certainly some studies, but uniformly it's been difficult to replicate that level of weight loss or weight change, I should say, in kids. A, a great study that came out recently, a couple different papers by Savoy and colleagues, the Bright Bodies Program at Yale Pediatrics Obesity Clinic. And in their study, they have the primary outcomes and then some 24-month uh, outcomes. They had 174 children, a wider age range, 8 to 16 years, a tougher group, just kids that were obese. And they had a much more diverse sample. It's a really nice uh, example, I think, of what you know, people want to see. I think roughly 35 percent of children were African American, the same number of Caucasian, and maybe 20 to 25 percent, that adds up right, uh, were Hispanic. Um, and it was a very intense intervention, though it's important to know. The intervention was a year long, included 98 hours of contact, uh, educational meetings weekly for the first six months, and then bi-weekly for the next six months. You know, nutrition education, behavioral change, a lot of the things I've talked about here. They also had 50 minute exercise sessions twice per week for the first six months and then two times per month for the last six months. And these were inter the, the educational meetings were facilitated by a dietitian or a social worker and then the exercise facilitated by exercise physiologists. And the control kids by contrast, you know, one clinic visit every six months for dietary counseling. Uh, so what results did we see in their study? An um, important point here is we see that 12 months over 25% and over 35% in, in the control group didn't complete 12 month assessment. And that's, you know, we see that a lot in long term studies, especially in this population. But what we did see, and they used intent to treat analysis, they saw statistically significant better improvements for kids in the Bright Bodies program. A decrease in BMI, or, yeah, BMI of roughly 1.7 units relative to an increase for kids in the control condition. And they also saw significant improvements in body fat, cholesterol, insulin um, for these children. I think it's fasting insulin and insulin resistance. But no differences in blood pressure, glucose, and a couple other measures of cholesterol. At 24 months, um, you can see here less than half the kids completed follow-up at two years. I mean, that's a lot, but um, that's not uncommon I don't know if that, to have that. Um, they still saw significant decreases in BMI relative to controls, again, using intent to treat analysis, and they saw still some improvements in, 
health markers that were maintained at that time. So there's a lot to like about this study because you know they work with a wide age range, mostly obese kids, children, and a um, you know, very diverse sample. But it was very, very intense intervention. And you think about how can we then translate that to real world settings. I'll talk about that, at least some important questions. Willfully did a study in 2007. I like this a little bit because it focused on the issue of maintenance. In a lot of programs, we might see some gains in the short term, but difficulties at maintaining these games, gains. And she had 148 children, seven years of age, focused on 20 to 100 percent overweight. And all these kids received a five month behavioral intervention, very standard and similar to Epstein programs. And all kids, uh, we saw a mean decrease of 0.22 BMI Z-score units. There was no control at this point in time. Um, and then kids were randomized at that point to one of three maintenance treatments, a behavioral skills uh, intervention that focused on relapse prevention and typical behavioral skills. Uh, or the, and they hypothesized that it's a lack of skills that, that leads to relapse in, for this intervention. The social facilitation model, the theory is that Relapse occurs because there's a lack of in, in, a support in one's social environment. So they really focused on helping kids build social interactions that were physical activity based and um, increasing their social network. And then they had a control condition. So it was a unique study in that sense. It was published in JAMA. Um, unfortunately, you know, when you looked at 20 more, more four month follow up, um, they didn't see differences uh, in, at 24 months between any of these three groups in changes in weight outcome at that time. But when they pooled the two active interventions together, they then increased power. They did see greater decrease in weight outcomes at nine months relative to controls, but not at one and two years. Um, they did see an interesting moderator effect that those that had higher social skills seemed to benefit more from the social facilitation intervention and model. I think it just points to, one, the importance of maintenance, the challenge that brings, and then also some unique out-of-the-box thinking about you know, how we might to address, want to address that. And though the results, the results here weren't as strong as we wanted, I, I believe she and others have still continued down this road and I think is an important point in how we work with kids and families. And then Alyssa Jalalian um, in 2010, I just want to focus on this because she focused just on adolescents. Um, 118 overweight adolescents had a pilot study, and this is fo a, a larger follow-up study. And it's unique in how they worked with adolescents to increase physical activity. All the kids received a standard cognitive behavioral intervention focused on a deficit diet plan. Um, but then half the kids received a typical uh, aerobic exercise type of physical activity invention. So in clinic, they're riding bikes, they get to do some interactive dance, um, uh, they're doing uh, brisk walking and other aerobic activities in the clinic. The other half of the kids engage in outward bound types of exercises and activities that focused on building, uh, that focus on mental challenges, physical active challenges, to build social skills, problem solving skills, um, self-confidence. So another example of trying to think outside the box, you know, and focusing on with adolescents individually. Um, and it's a little bit intense too because they had a separate meeting each week for the dietary and the nutrition counseling and then another meeting uh, focusing on the physical activity. So a level of intensity, a couple of meetings per week. Um, they didn't have a no contact control group in this intervention which again it's important for debate. People think wow we need to have control conditions to compare but on the other side sometimes you're asking people to forego intervention for quite a while for these long term follow up data. Um, and some data, a fair amount of data shows that if kids aren't getting intervened, they are actually, for the most part, growing and increasing in their weight status. So um, we see some positive results. There was no difference between the groups, but we did see a roughly uh, a decrease in BMI Z score in both of these groups at 12 months. There's a number of meta analyses that are out there. I listed a few here. The references are at the back. I tried to focus on some more recent ones. Um, willfully, and, and the interesting thing is you'll look at the number of studies that are included and they really range so you have to, you know, the, the criteria for inclusion in these different reviews and amend analyses differ and that's why we might see some different results but they do seem to coalesce in a certain direction. Um, willfully in a recent meta-analysis had a 14 randomized control trials uh, in a 30 year period and they focused on randomized controlled trials of lifestyle interventions duration of interventions over four weeks 
treatment of obese and overweight youth, um, 18 years and younger. And you know, as I'm talking here, I'm not focusing on prevention programs, which are critical, but I'm focusing on, you know, if it's not apparent now, treatment of overweight and obese youth. And the results, it was interesting. You know, she looked at studies, the range of duration, nine weeks to 77 weeks of these treatments. Um, timing of follow-ups, you know, one month to five year. And you can see different high attrition rates. But overall, the effect sizes that she found in these 14 studies were pretty good. Uh, moderate to uh, large effect sizes. This is kind of an anomaly where we actually see higher effect sizes at follow-up uh, relative to the, the, the treatment, I think. Um, but some conclusions overall is that there were really no moderator effects and outcomes by age and gender. She did see a trend for more powerful effects with longer interventions, which is a common theme. Um, and we did see a decrease in effect size as the follow-up period got longer. Um, Kitzman in all, et al. in a recent study, much broader, larger number of 66 trials, um, all the way back from 65 to 2004. It's important to note over 60% of these studies in her meta-analyses were prior to 1990. Only eight were from 2000 and beyond. Um, randomized controlled trials again, um, no requirement for length of treatment, and there was no indication that there was a limit or an inclusion criteria that you needed intent to treat analyses, where you know, if kids dropped out, you used statistical measures to you know, compute that and, and place in the missing values through one or more different methods. Um, so that opens up things a lot more. It's not as strict of a criteria. But again, in this study, overall, an effect size at post-treatment of modest, 0.41. A follow-up a little bit smaller, 0.22. But they looked at parental involvement, got a little bit more detail, and they found that there were larger effect sizes when parents were educated about nutrition and food preparation, and larger effect sizes, three times as large, when there was parent training and behavior management activities. Because some studies didn't use that, so we're getting a little bit more evidence to see the support of that. Cochrane Review, you've probably heard of the different types of reviews that the Cochrane Group puts on, a much more stringent about the criteria for inclusion. And they completed a, a review, and I think 2005 was the one before this, that came to the conclusion that there was not data, there was not adequate data to support the, uh, the efficacy of behavior family interventions. Well, this recent one in 2010 came to a little bit different conclusion. Um, they originally pulled out 54 studies, and they made some general impressions that many studies show positive effects of, on adiposity, um, and that pair involvement was beneficial, and that there was no adverse effects of these interventions. That's another important point of debate. Some people are very concerned that by encouraging healthy lifestyle changes or diets, kids might start to engage in very unhealthy eating behaviors and may diet and that can lead to eating disorders. And I think that's a very legitimate concern. My contention is that in professionally administered programs that are monitored by professionals that use positive parenting, that focus on gradual change, you can have some very uplifting experiences and that you're not going to see increases in that. They didn't find any increase in these uh, of adverse effects such as this in these programs. Um, but Cochrane, when they focused on their meta-analysis and just limiting it to studies that qualified, that use intent to treat analysis, that use controlled conditions, a lot of Epstein's work doesn't qualify for these meta-analyses because of a lack of control groups. Um, they only found seven studies that met their criteria. Four were below, of kids below 12 years of age. They did find a statistically significant effect size. It was small, 0 0.06. Um, and then when you went for older, you found there were three studies that, that qualified with kids 12 and older. Another small effect size here. Um, there were insufficient studies that just focused on diet and physical activity that could tease that apart. There wasn't enough just to look at those, th those components by themselves. But truth be told, most of the interventions involve a multi-component program. And last but not least, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force in 2010 completed a systematic review of behavior weight and management programs. They had 11 high-quality studies they identified, a wide age range, most fairly recent. And you know, at 6 to 12 months, they looked at change at that point in time. And the changes were modest, but there were modest differences for kids in the behavioral groups to show greater, I would say, differences in BMI relative to kids in the control groups. And it's not, you know, we see decreases, changes of about 0.3 to 3.3. 3. 
and even greater changes are at that top half for the three most comprehensive and most intense programs. There we saw differences in BMI of roughly 2 to 3.3. For a lot of this, we're not talking about weight loss either. We're talking about maintenance of gains, and we're talking about differences between you know, the behavior group and the control group. So we're seeing a little bit of a drop in BMI in the, in the intervention groups, and then an increase in the control groups. Okay? And there, they concluded there's some evidence for improvements in insulin resistance, and there was no or little evidence for adverse effects, like slowed growth or development of eating disorder symptoms in these interventions. And they actually gave a grade of B, which said there's adequate evidence that the multi-component moderate to high intensity interventions lead to short-term gains, not, the, not the, the evidence we want to see for long-term gains. All right, so what are some of the conclusions? How can I go through this? All right, we started a little late, didn't we? Um, it's okay. It's okay? Thank you, Bill. Um, data, clearly, when we look at this, data supports the short-term efficacy of lifestyle interventions for kids older than six years of age. And the best improvements seem to occur in comprehensive, moderate to high-intensity behavioral multi-component programs, longer treatment, is associated with greater improvements. So the longer you can keep working with families, we see the better improvements over time. Um, no evidence for long-term effic efficacy, or not enough evidence yet to conclude that these interventions are e e efficacious at that time. Um, parent involvement is certainly beneficial, especially for elementary school age kids. There's some evidence of clinically significant improvements, little if any evidence of uh, adverse effects, but I think it's really important to note that there's less than optimal generalizability uh, to, you know, of these interventions to a diverse population and diverse settings. Many of the studies have been conducted in specialty obesity clinics with moderate to high intensity treatment, oftentimes with well-trained, highly trained PhD level psychologists or dietitians or exercise physiologists. Oftentimes, not all studies, we saw the Savoy study and there are certainly others. You know, but oftentimes you see mostly Caucasian, middle to upper middle class families. And the degree of obesity also is important to concern, you know, because we see a lot of kids now, we see a growing number of overweight children there in that morbidly obese range. And a lot of the interventions are focusing on, you know, overweight to obese, not in that morbidly obese range, not as much. Um, and we're not quite sure, though there is certainly growing evidence. I think there's a study by, I'm going to butcher the name, Kalarchian that came out that focused on more morbidly obese kids recently. So um, where do we go from here, quickly? Um, this is something I focus on because I do a lot of this translational work. One of the greatest challenges facing health promotion and disease prevention in a lot of people's minds is tra translating research findings into evidence-based public health clinical practices. Okay, as noted by Robinson in a recent commentary on a paper, you know, randomized controlled trials in real world settings are very, extremely valuable, but much too rare. And we need more of that. Okay? So how do we take these intense interventions, we have some evidence for efficacy, and then how do we deliver that in real world settings? You know, who can deliver an event? How can we deliver an intervention that right now is set up for uh, weekly meetings, for six months and then two meetings for physical activity for six months. At the, you know, it, it's difficult. Um, I, the efficacy studies certainly are critical uh, at setting the foundation for us to learn, but we need to go beyond that too now. And how do we translate this? So, you know, how, what type of intensity and duration do we need and, and how, what can we ask of parents? How do we balance that? Um, what type of settings, where can we deliver these interventions? What about primary care settings? Schools, churches, YMCAs, where can we, and what type of interventions can we deliver? And more importantly, how can they be then sustained over the long term? Who can deliver these interventions? You know, to get PhD psychologists and exercise physiologists in all these settings, to get the reach that we're going to need is going to be challenging. Um, you know, certainly we need a lot more research, you know, in economically and racially and ethnically diverse populations. And, you know, a question I have is you know, how then is this effectiveness maintained in larger trials? Right now we've got a lot of smaller trials. I'm going to talk about Project Story, our, our, our original pilot study. Um, one, one 
point to what we've done a little bit. Um, but then, you know, when you have a larger trial, how does that then transfer? Can you see the still same outcomes in these larger trials? You know, if you can take one thing away from this, you got to have a good acronym with whatever you're going to do. <laughs> now, some people might say story. That's what you came up with. Uh, sensible uh, uh, treatment of obesity in rural youth. Um, and it was funded by the NIDDK. It was a planning grant for translational research focusing on treatment of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So it's a really great mechanism. R34 for the pilot work and then R18 for the long-term trial by NIDDK, NHLBI, and others. And we focused on an intervention for kids in rural settings. You see high rates of obesity in rural settings and much fewer opportunities for treatment in those settings. And the interventions were delivered through cooperative extension service offices. Well, these are kind of original were ag offices, but they do a lot more now. And they have programs for kids and families and a cooperative extension office in almost every, every county in the U.S. Um, and we focused on programs that were delivered by extension agents that worked there along with people from our team. So it wasn't at its final version yet. And we had kids who were 8 to 14 years. And we looked at a behavior family intervention or a behavior parent only intervention, uh, trying to consider the cost effectiveness um, and then a wait list control. And it was a short intervention, four months, uh, 12 contacts over four months. I'm not going to get into great detail. But we saw some positive outcomes at four months and then six month follow up. So at 10 months, we saw kids in the family and the behavioral parent intervention had statistically significant uh, better weight mates or weight change, weight status change relative to those in the wait list control at 10 months. Okay. Certainly, there are some limitations. This, we didn't use intent to treat analysis in this sample. Okay? Um, there were other limitations, but I think it was a great feasibility study and it showed you know, what do we need to do. And as Robinson look, you know, also commented, you know, there's a lot to learn for all of us in, in, in real world settings, but you know, a lot of learned lessons can only be learned through randomized controlled trials in these settings. What can families do when you're asking to monitor? We are going to have families monitor everything. <laughs> no. You know, some families can, some families can, and you have to be flexible. When you're working in real world settings, um, you have to be flexible. Primary care settings, we see a lot of people talking about how we can do interventions in primary care settings because of the reach and the potential. But how can you do that with these types of intensive interventions? Brian Salins had a study about 10 years ago that gave a little bit of an example of what could possibly be done. There's a lot of studies and growing studies. Some have been effective, some haven't been. This was one that had some good data. Small study, 44 adolescents, randomized trial, um, and the healthy habits, the intervention, uh, what they did, it was, they started off where the adolescents came into Kaletic and they, computed, they completed a computerized assessment of lifestyle behaviors that generated an action plan. And uh, it was modified kind of off the, the PACE program by Salas and colleagues in San Diego. And they got this action plan that talked about some of the changes they might want to make and some of the targets. Then they sat down for a physician counseling session with an MD and they reviewed and finalized their action plan. A week later they met with the PI, uh, Brian Salins, each of the, the Healthy Habits kiddos, and they introduced self-monitoring and how that would be done and, and what that would be used for. And then they had weekly phone counseling for four months to facilitate behavior change. It was a standard behavioral protocol that they used. And they found that at those four months uh, that youth in the Healthy Habits program had statistically significant better weight status outcomes relative to those in the controls. Not dramatic, I mean 0 0.05, but you know we're seeing some positive movement and an example of something that could be feasible in primary care settings. Obviously there's a lot more work in a different array of things, using potentially motivational interviewing and other types of contact, things that we don't yet have the evidence base to say yes or no, do they work, but things that I think are certainly worthy of continued research to figure out how we can do these in more, hopefully, settings that can be sustainable and can reach a larger number of people. Interventions that target younger kids. Okay? We see that one in 10 kids now are meet criteria for obesity. We're looking at that preschool age range. Okay. One example of a study is by Lori Stark uh, at Cincinnati Children's, a launch project. This was her pilot, step, uh, pilot project data, just 18 children, two to five years of age, obese, um, working with kids and parents, alternating clinic visits, group visits, group meetings, versus in-home visits. Uh, so 12 weekly core sessions and then some follow-ups. 
focusing on maybe breakfast, the first meeting, then snack and lunch and dinner, um, uh, going into the home, helping families get rid of the red foods and setting up the environment a little bit better. Um, they did provide families with 14-day supplies of vegetables for, uh, so that they could do food exposures in session at, at home. That might not be as feasible in a large setting, but found some really good results. At six months, a decrease in BMI Z-score of 0 0.50 relative to an increase for those in the control. Um, she's conducting an R1 right now to follow that up. Now certainly the question is then, okay, now when you have to do this with a larger number of kids, it's oftentimes a little more difficult to maintain and treatment integrity and provide those types of things. So how can we do it? But a great example of hopefully what we can see more of in the long run. And we're hoping, we're working mostly with elementary age kids. We're hoping to do some extension work if we're lucky with younger kids too in this age range coming up. Um, and there are other wonderful programs with preschool age, younger kids. Uh, Marion Fitzgibbons does some great research in Head Starts, but more prevention programs, so I haven't talked as much about that, the Hip Hop Junior programs. Um, and there are plenty of others that I didn't mention. And Nicole was just talking a little bit about uh, some of the work that she's doing here with folks and has been learning about. And some sounds like some really wonderful ideas, uh, things that we can hopefully build in the future. I haven't talked about school interventions because a lot, we're talking mostly about prevention, overweight and obese youth. Um, but there's two I want to highlight, Planet Health by Gortmaker and then an intervention by Robinson in 1999, both of these, that did show some positive effects um, either with just with girls or across uh, the age groups or genders. But the interesting thing about these, you know, a lot of the school-based interventions, we see mixed results. It, it's challenging to see positive results, but they, both these interventions, just focused on curriculum to cut back TV time. Just focusing on decreasing on TV time. And they actually found some positive outcomes, weight status change outcomes. So I think that's interesting to note. Um, and certainly in the future, you know, school is one venue where kids spend a lot of time and trying to get you know, better changes in that setting is going to be helpful. I didn't put it on the slide. I saw a wonderful video from the Cornell Institute for Behavioral Not Economics and Nutrition in Kids. I'm not going to go into detail, but look it up. And they talk about stimulus control and setting up the lunch line and just about how you place the foods. And if you shut the, the, the cover to the, the ice cream container, Right? And if you just label the food and call it the big bad burrito versus not having uh, a name at all, you see better choices from kids. That is something that I think is doable in school settings that might not take a lot of money. I haven't done it, so I don't know, but you think about it. This, look it up. I think it's interesting. An interesting point by Little, who's done a lot of research in school stuff, is, is a concern about the state of literature, though, and you can talk about this overall, but certainly in school settings, and she laments the, the, the practice where that people will assess a battery of measures to measure weight status. BMI, height to weight ratio, a waist circumference, body fat, skin folds, and then if you find a statistically significant change in just one of those, and maybe with boys, you've got a successful intervention. I mean, it's certainly information you want to build on, but how we talk about our interventions, I think, needs a little guidance. Certainly, you know, I feel bad because I didn't dive into the literature as much on what is the evidence for interventions that target, that are developed and are evaluated to test culturally and linguistically appropriate interventions for kids and families from racial and ethnically diverse backgrounds. It's an area we certainly need a lot more research, a lot of development, a lot of examination, especially when you look at the higher rates of obesity for kids from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, and there's certainly some great research going on here and others. Um, we need a lot more of that. And I saw a meta-analysis looking at that, and I was all excited, and then I read it, and it actually was just interventions that had some kids that were from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds, but that included mostly white kids. So I didn't really glean much from that. But you, you know, they're doing what we can. I think it points to the fact that there's not a lot out there. And certainly, you know, we need to do more at examining the moderators and the mediators of change and outcomes in these programs. You know, what type of parent involvement? You know, what type of parent coaching? You know, what type of physical activity program? You know, what mediates and what interventions work best for what people in what situations? And a great article by Miles Faith and colleagues that was from the American Heart Association. It was kind of a position statement, scientific statement, just came out in advance access talks about parental involvement in programs, but gives a number of recommendations for gaps in the literature 
and areas for future research. It's a really good paper, so I'd recommend taking a look at that. And there's a lot of them out there. Um, ultimately, you know, I think halting this epidemic is it's going to ultimately depend. It's going to be determined by the quality and coordination of a range of obesity treatment initiatives alongside effective obesity prevention strategies. This came from the Cochrane collaboration and the summation. You know, we need efforts at all levels. And you know, when we work with kids and families in our programs, I think that's a very important component of what needs to be done. But I've seen it so many times where families are making good changes and then they get out in the environment and healthy foods are so difficult to get. They gotta travel 45 minutes to get healthier food options. There are not many people that are supporting them in their environment. And there's communities that have done wonderful things, but families aren't getting educated and getting behavioral strategies on the skills. What about regulations? We need things at all levels to really make a dent in that. And hopefully we're seeing more and more directions in that area. But we still have a lot to learn and a lot to go. A uh, long way to go. So, I always have to put a picture of my girls up there. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>